Okay, so welcome again to our first afternoon session today. Um, as we all know and learned, security is important and there's a long tradition in the Riot community to uh, talk about security, have security talks in the Riot Summit and there's also a long tradition of developing uh, top-notch security uh, um, functions, uh, primitives for the Riot op operating system, some of which were already named by uh, Christian in his slide. My name is Thomas Schmidt from Harvey Hamburg. I have the pleasure to guide you through this session. Our first speaker is... Uh, Hannes. Hannes. <laughs> Everybody knows Hannes. Hannes is the, mo the most or almost the most publishing RFC author in the 20 years we know each other. Uh, he has worked for Nokia, Siemens, ARM, Nokia, Siemens, Siemens, no, Siemens, 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 and recently he got a professor at the rhein sieg Hochschule, rhein -Sieg -Hochschule? is it correct? Bonn rhein sieg Bonn rhein sieg it's sorry. It's a uh, bigger area. In, uh, in the biggest, uh, biggest uh, area in Germany where people live. So, you will talk about security, about the thing that is actually, you know, several people in the room and several remote are actually directly working on, on what you're saying, so excellent. give an excellent show. <laughs> Thank you, Thomas, uh, and thanks for building up the pressure. Uh, I'm glad that uh, I'm here again with you. Uh, I've been to several Riot events, and uh, Thomas and Matthias invited me to come again, uh, speak to you. And I thought that I picked the topic of remote attestation, um, also not only because I work on it uh, right now, but uh, also because I looked through the past uh, Riot Summit uh, programs, like Christian did, in, uh, as he mentioned in the morning in his welcome speech, and there were obviously lots of different security topics covered, but uh, attestation wasn't one of them. Uh, so I thought that let's bring something different, new to the table. And as I will explain later, there's a lot of work going on on remote attestation, um, and also now coming more to the microcontroller sector as well, and I will uh, focus on that one. And as I, as I mentioned, I went through all the talks, uh, looked at what has been presented before, and there were a couple of, or at least in my view, interesting trends to observe. Uh, one was obviously an attention to communication security, and probably half of the room here has worked on communication security uh, and helped sort of get us where we are uh, today. I remember when uh, in the IDF, I think it was around 2010, when we started working on and defining different standards for IoT, um, the situation looked pretty grim. And now, obviously, many, many years later, and lots of uh, implementation specifications and interoperability tests, uh, now I think uh, communication security is in a, in a bit, pretty good shape. We've heard talks about DLS, DTLS. We heard about uh, ad hoc and, and uh, OSCOR, uh, different communication security protocols in different layers. Uh, so that's fantastic. And as you can imagine, it's a super important topic in a distributed system when you have communication going over all different places. So cool, uh, we did that. Um, we also had... Uh, then a little bit with a time shift, we looked at the security of the endpoint itself. Uh, we looked at hardware and software, or sort of isolation techniques, which obviously use a combination of hardware and software. Uh, we had talks about uh, Trust Zone, uh, Lena Gif, uh presentations about the BSA APIs. We talked about different uh, security mechanisms on the endpoint, which obviously also there was a huge progress made in the early days when you got a developer board, there was no hardware-based random number generator in there. You had basically no foundation to build on top of. Um, so that's, uh, I think we are in, in good shape as well. And then there were a couple of adjacent topics which I colored here in, in yellow or orange. Uh, it's not so uh, easily distinguishable here on this projector, um, which, somehow relate to those two topics, namely, and also interestingly to remote attestation, like both quantum crypto, uh, Kuhn talked about this, uh, 
firmware updates. We had various years of uh, presentations on firmware updates, and, and it's still a topic, uh, and obviously not just a topic in this room, but also a topic on the, on the regulatory side. Uh, sort of mandating firmware updates is, is, is obviously, and secure firmware updates, is extremely important for uh, a functioning ecosystem. And we had also a sort of this privacy topic as a cross-cutting field, which touches, of course, on communication security and, uh, and also remote attestation. So uh, I encourage you to look back at the docs. Uh, many of them are still very relevant today um, because industry needs some time to catch up with uh, the standards work and the research work you guys are all doing. But there's, and that's where remote attestation comes in. Uh, there's obviously a, a sort of the whole industry has uh, moved along and, and paid attention to other security properties in addition to, to those that I just mentioned. Um, because now we want to improve the security of the endpoint itself. We want to provide an information flow about like what is the bootloader version what is the firmware, what is the application sort of code running on a device? Does it have any specific security features? Um, does it store keys in a secure element rather than in software? Shall I use uh, the microphone? This the screen to the Zoom. Oops. <laughs> I wanted to change Sorry. it. Um, no problem. Um, Not my laptop. <laughs> so. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So lots of the characteristics about the device are actually known only to the device and its manufacturer, not to anyone else. Uh, and so uh, that's also not a new area of work, uh, but it, when it was started in the Trusted Computing Group, it initially wasn't sort of well received uh, beyond some very limited uh, use cases like uh, BitLocker. Uh, but now, recently, as progress was made on both hardware on the hardware side, but also on on the software ecosystem, so now we are taking a fresh look at it. Uh, I think it also has to do with some of the use cases, which I'm going to uh, show you at the next slide. Why uh, these questions uh, are now being asked again, and where we want to have some solutions. Now, click on the next slide. Good. So the couple of use cases, uh, which I admit have to, are mostly from the big sort of big machine market, if you will, laptops, uh, server side infrastructure, like the, the devices you have in your hand right now, not necessarily on, on devices uh, like the, the development boards that you have used in the morning for the uh, tutorial. Um, and I, will, uh, I won't go through all of them because then uh, my 20 minutes are are over and I haven't actually gotten to the main point. Um, I just give you two examples on uh, why people are working on remote attestation in, in terms of use cases. There's the confidential computing use case uh, where there is a desire for a developer to push code and data uh, to a machine, typically running in the cloud, these big servers, um, and they want to execute some operations there but they don't want the cloud provider to actually know what code and data you're executing. So that's a, that is a requirement coming from sort of industries like the medical side, the financial industry. If they outsource everything into the cloud, they don't want all the infrastructure providers to know what they are precisely doing. So that's an area of ongoing research and, and uh, product development work um, by all major chip manufacturers. So, uh, and remote attestation is a key element in this, in this area. Without remote attestation, the, this whole puzzle falls apart. Another example is, uh, like for all of those who uh, are from Europe, you may have been following some of the European Commission initiatives uh, on these digital identities, uh, and specifically EIDA 2.0. And there's the desire to create a digital wallet uh, and so with these digital wallets, the intention is that you store all sorts of credentials. Credentials meaning, for example, your driver's license, 
all these type of uh, things that you now or today have on, on paper or in a plastic card, uh, the idea is to um, sort of do a kind of a digital transformation and have them all on your, on your mobile phone. And, and that's where, uh, again, demonstrating that the device has certain capabilities to store those uh, credentials securely uh, plays an important role in, in the functioning of, of, uh, their, of their vision. And so that's, that's great. So we have all these sort of big machine use cases for, uh, for remote attestation. But uh, since we are here at the Riot Summit, we obviously care about microcontrollers and not uh, high-end servers somewhere in the cloud. And so let us shift to the microcontroller market. It was uh, many years ago uh, when um, a few former colleagues of mine, like specifically Thomas Fossati, uh, uh, worked on what is, is called the BSA at the station token, BSA, uh, the platform security architecture uh, at the station token. It's essentially using some of the latest, uh, or at that time latest, um, encoding mechanisms, CBOR and COSI, to uh, encapsulate uh, the information about the device. And it's specifically uh, focused on what is called initial attestation. So everything that happens while you are booting the device, while you are in a sort of uh, first few stages of uh, the process of starting the device. And uh, that work is, uh, is not published as an RFC yet. Uh, it took a long time, lots of dependencies. You know how the standards process works, but it's very, very close. Um, but it's, it's just a, a starting point for what has come afterwards in terms of um, functionality, and I will talk about that in a few slides. There is, uh, of course, code available that you can play around with. Uh, there's a reference implementation as part of uh, Trusted Firmware M. Uh, you can also use separate libraries uh, if you want and build it into other, other operating systems. Um, and there's also a verification service, so that's the cloud part. The cloud part, uh, there's sort of a whole architecture with it, and I will mention that very briefly in, a, in an upcoming slide. So this uh, uh, was kind of the beginning for some of those uh, microcontroller activities in terms of standardization activities. So how does this work from a device point of view? So the device, obviously we are talking about very low level software, small piece of software that interacts with the hardware to perform these measurements, to collect all that information. And that's what uh, these boxes indicate. Uh, there's the testing environment is the one that collects that data and wraps it in the previously mentioned formats, digitally signs it uh, to protect it against modifications. And it collects that data from different targets in target environments. Uh, for example, a target environment could be the underlying hardware, uh, which exposes information about, for example, a life cycle state. Processors have different states they are in. Um, or it could be information from the boot process. So the first stage bootloader makes a measurement about the first stage bootloader is typically in ROM. Uh, so it makes a measurement of, for example, if you use two-stage bootloaders, it takes a measurement of the next stage and provides that information. So a remote service can verify, am I running, or is the device running the latest version of the firmware and has the right configuration. Um, all of this, the, arch the architectural pieces are, in the meanwhile, described in a published RFC, this RFC 93. 34, uh, which is the RATS architecture. I think it's a, the RATS group, for some reason, uh, has become the go-to place for discussions around attestation uh, and has come up with uh, good terminology to talk about this, uh, this whole topic. So uh, pretty good accomplishment, I would say. Um, and that's where this picture was also taken from. But there's also different types of attestations. So what I was talking about previously with BSA, that was the initial version, and that's what people now refer to as platform attestation. It, as the name indicates, it describes features about the platform, hardware and software-wise. Um, but then in more recent solutions, you want to also have some 
assurance that, for example, keys uh, that are generated are stored in specific environments, protected environments, and that's what uh, people refer to as uh, key attestation. So there's additional information about keys. Um, and also the, about what you can do with those keys. Can they ex be exported, for example? Um, or do they, are they actually the private key? Is it never allowed to leave the device? Can you use the private, these, uh, these keys for certain operations, like signing for CAMs, etc.? cetera? Um, so that's, that has uh, changed a little bit. Um, and there's also the question about how often does some of that measured information change? Uh, and I will get to that point uh, later. Very jumping going forward, uh, more recent work, very recent um, is work on what is called uh, attested CSR. And this is um, ongoing work, not, not uh, hasn't left the working group, so it's done in a, in a, again in the IETF in a group called LAMS uh, that typically works on big standards. Uh, so it's defining an extension to a certificate signing request or a CSR. And uh, the work was done in a large, uh, large design team which consisted of various different people from industry, uh, people who work on HSMs, hardware security modules, uh, people from NIST and different, uh, those groups, um, users of the technology, like those who use uh, CAs typically, or run CAs uh, like Siemens or Bloomberg, et cetera, um, and telco manufacturers, but also CA providers. Uh, so. Uh, this functionality specifically addresses or well, adds the key attestation component. And later, as already I can tell you now, I'm going to ask you uh, if you're interested in this whole area of work to take a look at this document and uh, to provide us feedback. Um, because the more people look at it, uh, hopefully we can clean out some bugs that address a wider range of use cases. Um, so why was that done? Why did we care about key attestation here? Uh, and that's not just for the big HSM use cases, uh, like in the enterprises, but also for IoT use cases when you, when you do onboarding, device onboarding. You also, uh, you may have heard that in previous Riot Talks, uh, you, when you transition from your manufacturer provision certificate to your operational certificate, you are going through this process of uh, certificate the certificate signing request, you request the new certificate for the operational, uh, uh, for your operational credential. And the CAs, they want to have some assurance that the, the keys or the operators of the CAs, that the keys that are generated on the device are not exposed. They are not uh, stored in, in, like, in places where they can easily be retrieved or as, as the some people call it the walk away. Um, and there are nowadays uh, requirements, in this case from the CA browser forum, to actually, then they ask for solutions already like by June uh, 2023. It's of course a little bit, uh, um, was a little bit ambitious, to, uh, <laughs> um, probably not knowing how fast IETF works, but um, so that's, that was one of the driving uh, motivational links up below if you, if you are interested in the, in the background. And so an HSM can, by doing this, an HSM can be the small part in your IoT device, but it can also be the rack-mounted HSM part, can then demonstrate that the key has certain properties. Uh, and that's what this uh, CSR extension then, then adds. Um, so how does this look like then in the big picture, if, if you uh, were to deploy this? Um, Here's the attester, the previous one, the, the, the box that I showed, the IoT device in this case, uh, and it, uh, in an onboarding use case. So if you roll out the device, uh, this is probably not the smart uh, building uh, environment we are currently in, so uh, probably useless to point to some of the luminaires here. But um, uh, there's typically in a factory or in a, in a building like this, there's a uh, RA, Registration Authority, or uh, directly a CA, and uh, that CA gets this information, the evidence uh, from the device, and needs to make a decision. Uh, it needs to 
uh, make a judgment on whether that device is actually uh, has been modified with, or has been tampered with and so on uh, before it, it issues a certificate. And it uses this third party that I mentioned, this verifier, to make that assessment because you need to have some reference values. Uh, but I don't go into the backend infrastructure that would be a too long of a session. So there are in the meanwhile a laundry list uh, of specifications that exist for different attestation technologies, for the small devices, for the big devices, and for the even bigger ones in the cloud. Um, and here's some references in case you, you want to look this up. So that's the, uh, in your case, the left-hand side. And so those technologies combined then uh, utilize the uh, mentioned uh, extension to the CSR, and this is typically embedded into a protocol, a management, certificate management protocol, of which there are many, unfortunately. Uh, and that needs to, to happen. Those are these uh, other two references. And then uh, the verifier needs to also have sort of management interfaces to automate this whole process. So whenever you do a firmware update, you need to change the reference values because otherwise the golden values wouldn't match what the device provides. Um, and so on and so on. Um, good documents, uh, also many of which are published in the and discussed in the RATS working group in the IETF. Uh, but there's a close cooperation to some other organizations like the, the DCG, the Trusted Computing Group, uh, FIDO Alliance, NIST, and, and other, other organizations. So I think that's the, the big picture. If you dig into the details, uh, I think you are uh, well informed about the current state of the app. At the end, uh, you get the attestation result which is the feedback from the verifier, has everything, is everything fine or is it not fine? Like what parts match, what, what parts actually didn't. That is also available as a specification. There's open source available if you want to set it up. We've done setups and implementations, POC implementations at the IDF hackathons, uh, code available. Um, but there are also products uh, available from Intel and, and, and others. And getting to my, my last point, uh, you've already seen that for some use cases, like the onboarding use case, uh, this can be quite a, a handy mechanism to communicate this information uh, about the characteristics, the security posture of the device. Um, but there are other, other use cases in which I try to sort of like summarize all of in the slide with a few uh, references uh, for further reading. Um, there's this, in some areas is this device-to-device -device communication pattern where devices interact with each other. So smart home uh, environment, for example, um, which is sort of, of course, gaining importance also with the standards developed in this uh, organization on around matter. Um, and so there, attestation has been incorporated uh, as well. Um, there are nowadays uh, of course, uh, AI-specific use cases also on these small devices. Uh, so developers and, and companies are concerned that once they train their models and load their models also on IoT devices, which uh, nowadays have uh, special instructions to accelerate machine learning tasks, so typically uh, all these um, matrix uh, multiplications and so on, um, there is a need to deal with or check the integrity of the device, the posture, the security posture of the device, and only then provide upload that machine learning model so you don't accidentally load it into a QEMU uh, because someone is asking it for further analysis, which actually nicely ties back to the talk we had uh, just heard about uh, because that would prevent easy analysis of uh, what we just uh, heard about um, with the autom automated analysis of uh, firmware. Um, there's also more and more use cases in, in a bigger IoT environment where the microcontroller is only one part of the overall system design. So if you, uh, for example, if you work on industrial IoT, you typically use a combination of um, bigger chip, like an uh, A-class processor that sits next to an M-class processor, 
or actually they are combined into a system on chip. And this, the M-Class processor is the microcontroller running whatever your favorite uh, Rhythm operating system. So in, in this case, uh, Riot. And in fact, we actually had a talk at the Riot Summit uh, before where someone was talking about the SDM32 MP1 and how he managed to replace the uh, M-Class operating system there with Riot. Uh, so um, quite, I think a quite relevant use case uh, also for, um, for those use cases. So you actually cover not just the constrained IoT use cases, but also the, the big IoT use cases which, uh, which some people are, uh, are looking into. If they want, for example, they've mentioned camera uh, in the previous talk, most likely uh, that's running uh, as a much more powerful processor because it needs to do the, the camera processing. Um, so it will probably be paired up with a microcontroller for security purposes. Um, there, is also, there are also devices that don't do secure boot, but they do measured boot. So they collect all that um, information during the boot process but then just storing that on locally on the device doesn't give you much. Uh, so you have to communicate it securely somewhere. And if you do that, the remote party, typically your management uh, entity, can then verify and check whether everything is fine, rather than having the device stop altogether and not do anything anymore, which in, in some uh, industries is, is not necessarily an option because you can't sort of easily walk over and then check what went wrong. Um, and then the, and in cases where information changes quite dynamically, so if, uh, for example, if you also want to take uh, location information into account, sensor input, uh, and include that as part of uh, remote attestation, you then need something uh, uh, to communicate that to other parties securely. So that's the trusted I.O. Uh, functionality. And that's where um, remote attestation on, on an embedded device is also really useful. Uh, so you have a bunch of use cases. And the question is, of course, uh, what's your use case uh, to make, uh, take advantage of this? There's, there are use cases where remote attestation is not useful. Uh, for example, if you are the one-stop shop provider that runs everything, builds everything, and runs everything, you know precisely what device you are running and what the device is doing. And if, if none of these other things are, uh, are true, then you don't, you don't need uh, remote attestation. But that's, of course, not uh, the case for, uh, for, most, for most companies. So what are the next steps? So there's, as I said, there's uh, still a lot going on. So it's not uh, by no means completed work. It's... it's uh, I think we are in, in many areas just at the beginning. So we, we looked at early stages, we tried things out. Some of the things got, uh, are in deployment uh, or early deployment, but there's more coming along the pipeline. And the key attestation functionality is something that is uh, still uh, in, in the working group. So uh, if you're interested in this topic, uh, please, please have a look at it. Uh, your feedback would be valuable. There are examples at the bottom focusing on the DICE, uh, another technology, attestation technology. There's DPM-based att attestation in there, example with a code and everything. Um, there, we've integrated attestation into DLS, and we are going to hear another talk uh, just in a minute uh, about the integration into another protocol. So um, I think there's, there's a lot of room for collaboration and, and uh, ways to advance this topic and to see what comes out of it. And with that, I would like to conclude. Yeah, thank you very much. So questions, comments, discussion, everything welcome. Yeah, who said yeah? Can you raise your hand? Okay. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for giving us this overview. Um, what I would take away from this for Riot OS is that it looks to, appears to me that um, 
using this uh, that measured boot you mentioned uh, would help. Uh, um, sounds like that sounds like something that should be doable even in a in a highly portable way, in the sense that we are not too much dependent on architecture specifics. Would such a measured boot be enough to give us, for example, a um, post compromise um, integrity um, checks again, so that we can do an update and be sure that the update was installed, even though the device might have been compromised in between? Um, I, thanks, Christian, for the question. Um, it, the answer depends a little bit on the details of the whole architecture. So ideally, you have some, you, your attestation functionality, call it service, uh, is, is pretty low in the, in, in the firmware stack. Uh, and also your update mechanism, which I call, let's say, firmware service, uh, is also fairly low in the, in the stack. So if those are compromised, then obviously all bets are off. Uh, so that, that would be a problem. But if the higher, uh, higher layers of the software are compromised, you could then uh, do it or modify it or are not expecting. It doesn't need to be compromised. It just could be in a state that you, the device was in a shelf in a uh, warehouse for too long. You realize when it puts up, it doesn't meet your uh, expectations that doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually compromised. It's just not there where you want it to be. Um, and so you, you could recover from that. Um, in, but uh, yeah, it depends. On, unfortunately, like I sound like a lawyer, it, it depends. Uh, and then you I charge you for telling you the, the whole answer. Um, but yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Hannes, for this talk. Um, so I, I have like one maybe like um, angle, like coming from like an OS, like Riot, like software oriented, uh, depending on more hardware is like something of a devil-edged sword. So like um, a lot of this work seems to, um, well, try to use like additional hardware capabilities. And um, so my question is twofold, two, two, twofold in this aspect. So like how hard was it to uh, harmonize between different hardware vendors uh, from your perspective? And I know you've been working for one, so maybe you, you know from, from the inside. And, and second, like um, do you see um, uh, like any Danger in like uh, going that direction, like pushing more stuff in hardware. Um, and yeah, mm -hmm. the f the first one uh, I would summarize is like, what are, what are the challenges in getting this actually working? Uh, so a big challenge is the passing the information up the different layers, and I think that will also be a challenge in 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 Riot because um, if you just think about the the boot process, the boot bootloader, for example. The bootloader needs to, uh, in like, it, if you think about it in an abstract way, it just makes sure that it starts the next the next layer um, of code. But then now with these mechanisms, you suddenly have to establish a communication pipe up to the higher layers because you need to communicate something. So you need to have that sort of interface somehow defined. Of course, you also have these other pipes already in the other direction from firmware updates because actually it's in a bi-directional path because you, you give the firmware down, store it down, but then you need to report up some status uh, or have a way to set the status and, and indicate the new booted firmware as valid and so on and so on. Um, so that communication channels uh, need to be defined and you need to add them to um, whatever bootloader or whatever software layers you have. So that's a challenge. Uh, and it's not only a challenge with microcontrollers, it's also a challenge with if you do it on embedded Linux, because there you have suddenly U-boot, and then you have trusted firmware M, or trusted firmware A, and then you have all sorts of different layers, and maybe you have some virtualization, you pass it up with virtualization layer. It becomes very complicated very quickly. Uh, so that's, uh, I think that's one uh, bigger challenge. Another challenge is, um, communicating, communicating the unpleasant news that you now need to have another set of keys uh, because the attestation keys are not just some other random keys that you can use because different keys for different purposes. Uh, so you need to 
provision those keys as well, that's also a little bit of bummer. Uh, um, and of course, uh, the, the whole, like in general, whenever you talk about key, this whole post-quantum topic sort of overshadows everything because those are, these, these keys are long-term keys, so they are probably not changeable. So you have to think about algorithms, et cetera, et cetera. Since you are, uh, unlike the firmware updates, this is, uh, these need to be signing keys. Uh, potentially you need to, and that comes to your second question about the, uh, what dangers I see. Uh, so there are dangers on respect to privacy. Uh, so you may need to think about like, who do you send all these detailed information to? And that's not only, a, of course, a concern for IoT, but in general with remote attestation there. And people have expressed these concerns, like there have been concerns with uh, Android and web use of uh, attestation. Uh, of course, with FIDO, uh, with the FIDO pass key, uh, there have been concerns with attestation. So it's, uh, it's a, it's a, a a difficult trade-off. Uh, you can design something that is quite simple, uh, but then it exposes a lot of information, or you can come up with lots of privacy, uh, sophisticated privacy techniques, all the way from, like, you have issue a batch of keys to devices, or you use a privacy CA, it requires more communication, or you use, uh, let's say, one of the uh, advanced crypto schemes, like these uh, RSA blind signatures, you use these uh, SNARKs and, and so on, zero knowledge proofs and so on. Um, so it can, it's, it's a tricky thing. Uh, and whether you can have sort of like the uh, easy to use and uh, completely privacy preserving uh, story is uh, yet something that needs to be found out which I unfortunately don't have an answer for. It's actually one of the, the open issues uh, that, uh, or big open issues and questions that uh, we always get when, or I always get as well, when I give a presentation to the DLS working group about a tested DLS, uh, what's the question I get? Will this be used in a web environment? Will I suddenly send off uh, all my device data, uniquely identifying data about what software I run, what version, what everything to my website? as I browse through the, the internet. So, yep, there are some, uh, I didn't mention that during my talk. Uh, there are some open issues, yes. Uh, thanks for pointing this out, Emmanuel. So I guess if there are no more questions, we thank uh, Hannes again. So, and... Uh...